So in the last video we've seen how to encode a uh, Lie algebra in terms of uh, its roots. So the roots form a uh, root system which has to satisfy quite stringent uh, properties. So what we'll see now is that in fact um, you can further condense this information into um, something which is very manageable. And in order to do so, um, let's have a look at the uh, angles that are possible between roots. So as you can see from these two examples, actually the, the angles are quite limited. Here I have a pi over 4 angle, while here I see angles of pi over 6, um, or pi over 3, multiples of them. Um, so what we'll see is actually that there are not that many options available. So let's look at the uh, angles between roots. And for this we can nicely use the third property. So suppose, so, so what does 3 uh, imply? So suppose I have a root alpha and another root uh, beta, and let me take them not to be uh, identical or uh, reflections of each other. Um, so if both roots, then this property number three tells me that if I project beta along alpha that it should give a half integer multiple of alpha, so that is saying that this quantity should be integer. But the same should hold when I project alpha along beta. So I also get that 2 alpha dot beta for beta dot beta should be an integer. Um, so here is a um, nice consequence of this. So let's look at the product of these two. So they also have to be integers. So the product explicitly is 4 times alpha dot beta squared over the squared norm of alpha times the squared norm of beta. And what do we recognize here? Well, here we recognize exactly the cosine law of the angle between alpha and beta. So this is exactly 4 cosine squared of the angle theta between alpha and beta. So I have a root alpha, so another root beta, and an angle in between. Now a consequence of the fact that projecting beta onto alpha should be a half integer multiple of alpha and projecting alpha onto beta should be a half integer multiple, multiple of beta, it tells us what the possible angles are between alpha and beta. Okay, so let's make a uh, just a, a small table of the, the values that I can have here. So this is an integer. So what are the possible values of 4 cosine squared of this angle? Now, um, well clearly this cannot be negative, so the smallest possible integer would be 0. And 1, 2, but what is the largest possible integer? Well, cosine does not become larger than 1, so 4 would be a possibility, but uh, the cosine being equal to 1 or minus 1, that means exactly that you know, these vectors have to be parallel to each other. And by property 2, um, the only multiples of alpha, so the only roots that are aligned with each other are alpha and minus alpha, and I just excluded that possibility. So the only options are really 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what are the corresponding angles? Theta, alpha, beta. Right, so zero, uh, cosine being equal to zero, that means that this angle 
since it has to be smaller than pi, it can only be pi over 2. So alpha and beta are going to be perpendicular to each other. Um, so in the second uh, situation, um, we want the cosine to be equal to 1 half, which happens exactly for pi over 3, or 2 pi over 3. Then, for this e to be equal to 2, cosine should be uh, 1 over square root of 2. So that happens at pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. And finally, um, for the cosine to be equal to uh, square root of 3 over 2, this should be pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. Um, so we see that these angles for SO5 and G2, they exactly appear in this list. Uh, here for SO5 and here for uh, G2. Now we can say a bit more than just the angles um, because we have a comparison uh, between the lengths of these roots. So let's see what the, the relative length is going to be of these roots alpha and beta. So how can I determine this? Um, in terms of these numbers, well, the way to extract the, uh, the ratio of the norms of these roots alpha and beta is by taking ratios of these and then taking a square root. And so this is exactly 2 alpha dot beta beta dot beta divided by 2 alpha dot beta alpha dot alpha and then taking a square root. And we notice that these these have to be integers and they have to multiply to give this value, so the integer here. So we can immediately extract what the possibilities are. So how about the case when the, the product vanishes? Um, well then we can't say anything, right? Uh, this uh, product is going to vanish uh, when alpha dot beta theta is equal to zero independently of its length. So this is going to be arbitrary. It can be anything. Um, if it does not vanish, for instance when it's equal to one here, it means that the product of these two integers has to be equal to one. So, uh, what does that mean? That means that, um, uh, okay, so they should either be both equal to 1 or both equal to minus 1, but the sign doesn't matter because I'm taking the ratio here. So this ratio is going to be equal to 1, so these roots have to be of equal length. Now if I have a 2 here, then or the factors, they can be well, one of them has to be equal to 1 and the other one has to be equal to 2. Or again with a minus sign, that does not uh, appear. Um, so that means that at this ratio it's either the square root of 2 or 1 over the square root of 2. So we get square root of 2 or 1 over square root of 2. Uh, okay, let me be size here. Um, and then finally, for to have, get a 3, we need that these factors have to be uh, 1 or 3 divided among themselves. So we get here that it's either a square root of 3 or 1 over the square root of 3. And indeed, looking at this picture, the ratio in length between these two roots is exactly uh, square root of 2. And here if I had drawn this carefully, the ratio of the roots of these two would be um, square root of uh, 3. And if I compare, say, this root to that root, then the angle is pi over 3, and I get a ratio which is equal to 1.
Okay. Um, so we know that the, the angles uh, have to be among a, a very uh, limited set, but still there are quite a number of factors that one may have to, to specify. So we're gonna, what I'm going to show now is that um, really among all these, in this case uh, 12 roots for G2, I only really have to specify two of them in order to fix this picture. And in general, I only will have to uh, specify a number of uh, root factors equal to the rank of the uh, Lie algebra. So let's see why this is the case. And for this, I need two definitions. Um, let's go. So the definition, a root alpha, so that is a a vector with number of components um, equal to the rank of the Lie algebra, it is positive if its first non-vanishing component is positive. If its first non-zero component is and of course otherwise we call it a negative root. So let's just uh, check in these two examples. So what are the positive roots? Um, so certainly if the first component is positive, it's going to be positive plus plus plus. Um, then there are two roots here that have zero first component. So then I look at the second component and then only this one is positive. So similarly here have that these are the positive roots. So what is the purpose really of this definition? Um, it is a way to um, label all roots by being positive or negative. Uh, in some sense we want to say that uh, the, all the, the, the roots that are pointing to the right are really raising uh, correspond to raising operators and all the ones or the negative roots that point to the left are um, lowering operators. And then since you may have roots that actually lie on the on the on the vertical axis, we you know, inter put this more elaborate notion of positivity in there to break the symmetry. Okay? And then I say that a root, or to be more precise, a positive root, a positive root is um, simple if it is not the sum of two other positive roots. So let's again, okay, and let me, let me write here. Um, we use uh, the notation with a hat for the, the simple roots. I like to put a hat on the, on the root. Um, so let's see in these examples. So we have to choose among these four which ones are the simple ones. So which one is certainly not simple? Well, for instance, this one is not simple because it's the sum of this positive root and that positive root. Um, similarly, this root here is the sum of that one and that one. So these are not simple, but okay, I claim that these two are simple. I put a hat there. Similarly here, the simple ones are going to be this one and that one. And the way you should think of these simple roots is that they really lie kind of on the extremities of the, of the positive uh, roots. So I was singling out uh, essentially a cone corresponding you know, to the, the span of all these uh, positive 
uh, roots. And then these two, they really lie kind of leftmost, if you like. So they're going to be simple. And the same is true here. So these simple roots um, satisfy a number of properties. Let me write them down. So properties a root system of rank R has exactly R simple roots. Which are linearly independent, so they form a basis of your RR, uh, R, which form a basis the r-dimensional space and importantly all other roots can be obtained by successive um, while reflections while reflections on simple roots. So let's see. Um, so if we just start with these two, maybe you can do better do a picture here. So we st let's do the SO5 example. So we have these two positive roots or a simple roots. Um, so if I then do while reflections um, on kind of any pair of vectors among these, well, the first thing you you can do is take the while reflection of a root in itself. So that is just um, its uh, its reflection. Like this and take the reflection of that one. So I'm gonna give this. Um, then, for instance, I can look at the, the while reflection of this vector um, in, in that one. So I have to take the reflection in the plane perpendicular to this one. So that's going to give this vector. Um, similarly, reflection of uh, this vector in itself is going to give that one. Um, the while reflection of this vector and that one, gonna give this one, and then you get also that one. So by re applying these um, while reflections, I have actually found all the roots again. And the same you can check to be true for G2. Um, If alpha and beta are simple roots, and I look at their difference, alpha minus beta, then that is never a root, not even a non-simple or non-positive one, uh, is not a root. In this uh, example, if I look at the difference of this simple root and that simple root, there will be a vector that ends up here. Well, that's certainly not a root. And then part four. Um, if I have two different um, simple roots, simple roots. Then if I look at their inner product, 
it cannot be positive. So this will allow us to uh, draw some uh, some more conclusions. Now the first part of this, this you will actually show in the exercises. So uh, exercise show one. Um, we're going to skip proving uh, part two. So we'll just admit that this is true. So skip two. And let's now sh see um, why three and four uh, must hold. Okay, so let's look at three. Um, well, and the, the the reasoning is actually quite simple. Um, if we look at alpha minus beta, so if alpha minus beta were a root, then, um, well, it could be positive. Or, if it's not positive, then I would take uh, its negation, its reflection, and then that would be positive. Because that is always the case. Then either this or beta minus alpha would be positive. Positive root. But then I could write um, alpha is beta plus alpha minus beta, or I could write this as um, uh, let's see or I could write if you like, uh, beta is alpha plus beta minus alpha. So if this one is positive, then alpha would really be the sum of two positive roots. But that is not allowed because alpha was simple. Now if beta minus alpha would be positive, then I could write beta as a sum of two positive roots, which is also not allowed. So this is a contradiction. So how about uh, the fourth point? Um, so what we can conclude from part three is that if I act with the lowering operator E minus alpha on the state corresponding to the uh, simple root beta. Um, that, well, let's see wh what can happen. Um, well, this has to vanish. Why? Uh, because otherwise it would be proportional um, well, to to a root with well to to a vector with root uh, beta minus alpha. It would be proportional to e beta minus alpha. Um, right, because it's a vector that has uh, weight beta minus alpha. Um, I have assumed that beta is not equal to alpha, so it cannot be a Carton generator. So it has to be proportional to such a state, but I just said that this cannot be a root. So 3 implies this. Um, but then we recall that this was really the lowering operator of the SU2 algebra 
associated to the root alpha hat. This is the lowering operator, well, up to a normalization of, uh, of alpha, lowering operator of an SU2 subalgebra. And it annihilates the state. But that means that the state is a lowest weight state. So a beta is a lowest weight state in this uh, particular representation. So that implies that if I look at what happens when I act with my um, my my, uh, my e three um, operator in this SU two subalgebra, so so what is this again? So e three that was um, this particular. Uh, operator uh, acting on E beta put the hats here but this is exactly alpha hat dot beta hat alpha hat dot alpha E beta hat so it is really an eigenstate of this SU2 operator, the third one. And it's also a lowest weight state. But we know from the, the, the SU2 representations that the lowest weight state, it can never have a positive eigenvalue. Right? It has to live in some spin J representation and the lowest weight state in the spin J representation, it has eigenvalue minus J. And J is zero or, or positive. So it follows that this has to be larger or equal to zero. Uh, sorry, smaller or equal to zero. So this is smaller or equal to zero. So therefore, um, yeah, we get the result I just claimed. Um, so this wraps up these uh, properties. Um, so to specify specify a compact Lie algebra, it is sufficient to specify its simple roots. Um, so exactly R of them, but specifying the simple roots, so I really have to specify R vectors in an R-dimensional space, for that is really sufficient to list their inner products. So this is equivalent to, so up to a change of basis, um, of the Cartan subalgebra, they are uniquely uh, determined by the inner products. And the inner products, they appear in the Cartan matrix, determined by the Cartan matrix A. So this is a R by R matrix given explicitly by A I J is given by the inner product of the I simple root with the J's simple root factor of two and then normalized by the norm of the J simple root. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so let me just write down here what this uh, Cartan matrix looks like. Say for SO5, we find that A is given by 2 minus 1, minus 2, 2. And here the Cartan matrix is given by 2 minus 1, minus 3, 2. And quite generally, so in general, it has the following form. So it has 2 on the diagonal, well, just by definition. And how about the, uh, the element uh, AIJ and the element AJI for no, not on a diagonal. So it's given by these quantities. We know that these are integers. And we also know that they are negative. So really there are only um, three options, or uh, in fact four options. So they can be zero. So this corresponded to having an angle between them pi over two. They can be both equal to minus 1, corresponding to an angle of uh, 2 pi over 3. Now, pi over 3 is not an option because they have to be a negative inner product. Um, then I can have minus 2 minus 1 or minus 3 minus 1, where this corresponds to an angle 3 pi over 4 and this to an angle 5 pi over 6. Um, so this tells you completely what uh, values can appear in these matrices. And as soon as I've given such a Cartan matrix, I can well, determine what the vectors look like up to a linear transformation. Then I can use the while reflections to build all of the roots, and I claim that if you have all of the roots, you can fully reconstruct the Lie algebra structure. So we've went through this whole procedure, and in the end, it all boils down to a couple of integers to specify your Lie algebra. Okay, so um, next week we're gonna um, use some of this structure in the case of uh, SU3 which is also a rank 2 Lie algebra so we'll actually draw the corresponding root diagram and see how knowing about these roots can help us in determining the representations of SU3 and then in the last uh, week what we're going to do is we're going to really classify all possible Cartan matrices to see what are really the, the possible compact Lie algebras that one can get. Okay, bye.